It's my honor to be here today to talk to you about my favorite subject, which is sectional title. A lot of people think I'm quite crazy to be quite in love with the topic as I am. I'm a trustee in a body corporate where I own. I used to be a managing agent of sectional title in HAA complexes. I did my master's in sectional title as well. I spent some time in Australia at the University of Melbourne, learning a bit about their strata title system. I spent some time in Australia at the University of Melbourne, where I learned a bit about the strata title system, which our South African legislation is, is strongly based on. As I said, I was a managing agent for Pam Golding Property Management Services here in Cape Town, and I did more articles with Marina Constas of BBM or Bakari Bolo Mariano, also a law firm in Cape Town, as well as across, across South Africa. In South Africa, there are two different types of title to land, conventional title and sectional title. Conventional land is also referred to as having full title in property. Conventional land consists of a measured piece of the surface of the earth, and this is shown as a, on a diagram in two dimensions, which is registered at the deeds registry. These pieces of land are known as urban stands or lots, depending on where you are in the country. Until 1973, conventional land held under a registered title deed and identified by reference to a diagram or a general plan approved by the Surveyor General was the only type of title to land that existed in South Africa. Conventional land was the only type of fixed property that could be leased and hired, bought and sold or bonded. Ownership of conventional property also included all the soil beneath the surface, subject of course to any mineral rights, and most importantly for this discussion, all parts of any buildings erected on the land. It was not possible to have separate ownership of multiple areas of a building, or even of multiple buildings built on one piece of conventional land. Under the Sectional Titles Act of 1971, a new and different title to land was established. The reason that it was necessary to introduce sectional title ownership into the South African real estate market was that conventional title did not allow for separate ownership of various parts of buildings, and it wasn't able to meet the growing demand for ownership that South Africans were experiencing. The 20th century was characterized by ever-increasing numbers of people leaving the countryside and moving towards the densely populated urban areas. In the increasingly crowded cities, it was necessary to accommodate people in multi-story buildings. Because conventional title is based on the principle that the person who owns the land also owns everything attached to it, including all or any parts of buildings, it wasn't possible to allow two or more different people to have registered ownership of different parts of a building or a dwelling, on, or on two different levels of a multi-story building, for instance. In practice, that me this meant that conventional title was adequate for rental accommodation and for ownership of semi-detached buildings, but it did not allow for ownership of separate apartments or sectional title units as we know them today. To get around the restrictions of the law in this regard, the developers of multi-story buildings who intended to sell the rights to occupy separate flats historically used a cumbersome legal device, registering the entire property in the name of a company and then offering individual purchasers shares in this company. This gave them some form of security, but they never had a registered right in it. They simply had a share which was accompanied by a long-term lease agreement. This device did not result in the buyer holding any real rights that could be registered at the deeds registry. They couldn't do a deed search and see that they actually own something. Perhaps more importantly, the South African financial institutions that offered home loan finance on the basis of registered mortgage bonds were not prepared to offer the same rates of interest that they did to owners of conventional land to these owners of simple shares in buildings. The result was that only people who were able to take advantage of what became known as a share block company system were those sufficiently wealthy not to acquire or require, rather, any need for home financing. The vast majority of flat dwellers were therefore only tenants. To protect tenants, both those in attached homes and those in flats, from exploitation by landlords, the government introduced rent control legislation that effectively limited the amount of rental the owner of a multi-story building, multi building could charge for residential accommodation, particularly to persons in the low income groups. As a result of rent control legislation, landlords became reluctant to spend money on maintaining apartment buildings, which has resulted unfortunately in a lot of buildings that we still see in our major cities today. 
The Sectional Titles Act of 1971, which became effective in 1973, provided a solution to what had become both a social as well as a real estate problem. Under this legislation, it was for the first time possible to obtain registered ownership of just a part of a building. During the course of the late 1970s, the late 1980s, as well as the early 1990s, the vast majority of blocks of flats that had been owned by financial institutions and investors were developed under sectional title. The flats in them were made available to be individually bought and mortgaged in the South African property market. Since the early 1980s, virtually all new apartment blocks have been developed into sectional title schemes. In addition, the sectional title legislation is sufficiently flexible to cater for developments that do not include only multi-story dwellings or buildings. A very substantial proportion of the new housing developments include semi-detached and completely detached dwellings have also been developed into sectional title schemes. We also have a lot of homeowners associations, mostly in the Western Cape, as most of you will know, which will soon fall under the same legislation as sectional title, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. It would be fair to say that since the mid-1980s, almost all new property developments that are not state-funded, of course, have come onto the market as sectional title schemes or homeowners associations. Before I move on to deal with some more of the detail of sectional title, let us look at the requirements of the Estate Agency Affairs Board's Code of Conduct with regard to estate agency services. First, let us look at Clause 4, headed the duty to disclose. An estate agent shall convey to a prospective purchaser all facts concerning such property as are or should reasonably in the circumstances be within his personal knowledge and which are or could be material to a prospective purchaser. As we go through this presentation this afternoon, I suggest that you ask yourself the following question. What are the facts in regard to a sectional title property that are within your personal knowledge and which are or could be material to a prospective purchaser? In other words, what will a prospective purchaser ask you as an estate agent or a managing agent or even a trustee? What do they want to find out about the sectional title development in which they're interested in purchasing? What are the questions that you should have the answers to? Secondly, let us consider clause 5.3 of the Code of Conduct, found under the heading duty not to make misrepresentations or false statements. No estate agent shall claim to be an expert or to have specialized knowledge in respect of any estate agency service if in fact he is not such an expert and does not have such specialized knowledge. So if you cite to yourself to be a specialist in the sectional title sales or market industry or management industry, you really need to know the issues that we're going to briefly touch on today. Having looked at the background to the introduction of sectional title ownership, let us examine this type of title and ownership in more detail. The concept of sectional title, as I mentioned earlier, was borrowed from that of strata title in, in Australia. It was trialed in the state of New South Wales in the early 1960s and then adopted in all the other states and territories of Australia soon thereafter. Strata title is the dominant form of apartment ownership in Australia, New Zealand, the Far East and the Middle East. It has also been adopted in the Caribbean islands and in the Canadian province of British Columbia. A development under the Sectional Titles Act starts when a person who is known as the developer and who owns one or more pieces of conventional land decides to develop that land under the Sectional Titles Act so as to provide for ownership of separate parts of buildings. It is important to note that the Sectional Titles Act can apply to land and buildings put to any form of use. It is a rookie error to think of sectional title as only applying to residential accommodation. It can also accommodate mixed use schemes, commercial schemes, industrial schemes, as well as resort or holiday accommodation. And if in a few years time a, a new form of accommodation develops, sectional title will be able to handle that as well. As I indicated earlier, conventional title that is included in a sectional title um, development or rather conventional land doesn't have to be consolidated before the process begins. However, it is important to know that when there are more than one piece of conventional land that the developer wishes to develop in terms of a sectional title scheme, the, the land needs to be basically on the same side of the road. That's the simplest way I can explain it. If a developer owns two pieces of conventional land, 
that is not next door to one another or adjacent, he has to consolidate that land first. If he owns one large development, as we have in most of our winelands, the farms that have been developed into HOAs, the developer first needs to subdivide the land. So basically, you can't have one sectional title scheme on the left-hand side of the road and another one on the, on the right-hand side of the road. It would be two separate developments. The boundaries of a conventional property are shown on a two-dimensional diagram. All the land and buildings in a sectional title development are shown on a sectional plan, and one of the primary purposes of the sectional plan is to designate each part of the land as either forming part of a section or as the common property. The distinction of a section and common property is one of the most fundamental in sectional title. Any area that is destined to be used only by its owner is known as a section, and the rest is common property. Of course, common property can also be bound by an exclusive use area, which can either be registered or created in terms of the rules, but we'll touch on that a bit later. It is not only multi-story buildings that can be developed under the Act. It's possible and not unusual for entirely detached homes, both single and double dwellings, to be shown as sections on a sectional plan. In other words, it's possible to, to provide that a single building is divided into just one section and common property. I haven't come across this in practice. I don't know who will be crazy enough to want to develop a sectional title scheme where there's only one owner that is bound by the Sectional Titles Act and the prescribed rules. In Cape Town, however, we do have duets, which are two sections and common property. And believe me, it's more trouble than what it's worth. As indicated previously, the distinguishing feature of a section is that it is individually owned. It is normally an area confined by its floors, walls, and ceilings, but it can also include open areas such as a balcony. Sections can be made up of more than one separate part of more than one building. In practice, this means that a single section can comprise a residential flat on the fifth floor, as well as a garage in the basement or on the ground floor, although this is quite unusual. Unless the sectional plan specifically makes some other arrangement, each section extends to the median line or the center of its walls, floors, and ceilings. This is, of course, not real lines, but imaginary midpoints that split a section between the owner's liability and the common property or the body corporate's liability. On the sectional plan, each section is given a specific number so that if a section does comprise of separate parts, each of them will be labeled on the sectional plan as being part of a specific section. The example I gave you of the residential unit on the fifth floor might be section seven. The garage on the basement floor might be part of section seven, or it might be a section on its own. It could also be common property or an exclusive use area. If it's an exclusive use area, is it registered or created? See, it's not really that simple. Each section is allocated a specific participation quota in terms of a participation quota schedule. This forms normally the last page of a sectional plan. The significance of the participation quota of the section is that it determines the owner's share in the common property, his votes when votes are taken by poll, and of course, the amount of levies that he has to contribute towards on a monthly basis. So I've explained the concept of a section and of common property, as well as the participation quota. But the most important aspect is how these three fit together. In a sectional title scheme, people own units. Each unit consists of a specific section having its own number, together with its allocated share in the common property, obviously determined according to the participation quota. So every person who owns a sectional title property, in fact, owns a section as well as an undivided share in the common property of that same sectional title development. The other really important thing to understand about sectional ownership is that any person who owns a unit, again, being a section and an undivided share in the common property, is also a member of an association that exists for the scheme and is known as the body corporate. I have a lot of clients that refer to the trustees as being the body corporate. The only time the trustees will be the body corporate is if every single member of the body corporate is a trustee. If you own in a sectional title development, you are part of the body corporate. You can't have the distinction of us and them or body corporate and trustees. You're all members of the same scheme. 
The idea that when you own property in a sectional title scheme, you are not the owner of any specific area, such as an apartment or a commercial shop or an office, but also share ownership of all the common property with all the other people who own sections in the scheme, is one of the really misunderstood elements of sectional title real estate. It is of vital importance that purchasers of sectional title property understand that they have both rights and responsibilities with regard to all parts of the scheme, not only their sections, but the common property as well. Without this understanding, it's not clear to them why they have to contribute on a monthly basis towards their share in the common property, why they have to contribute to the swimming pool that they never swim in, or the main entrance that they never drive in. It's all part of common property, and they all have the use and enjoyment of it. The fact that a sectional title owner is automatically and involuntarily, unfortunately, a member of the scheme's body corporate is also something that many owners would prefer to forget, especially when the body corporate is asking them for money or trying to bind them to the scheme's rules. While all the parts of a sectional title scheme that are not part of sections are automatically common property, it does not follow that all of these areas are available to use by everybody. It is possible, as I mentioned earlier, for parts of the common property to be set aside by the use of only one owner. This is achieved by giving these particular owners exclusive use rights. As I mentioned earlier, exclusive use rights can be registered and then would be attached to your title deed. It would then appear if you had to do a deed search. It would also appear on the sectional plan of the scheme. But to make life more difficult or interesting, as I like to say, it can also be created in terms of the scheme's rules. Exclusive use areas are not created in terms of the prescribed management and conduct rules. So if the scheme that you're marketing or living in or managing has only the prescribed rules as per the Act, they don't have exclusive use rights created in terms of the rules. The scheme's own set of either management or conduct rules, sometimes both, have to have that right allocated to owners. It is important to remember that when one or more owners have exclusive use of a part or a feature of the common property that serves only their purpose, it's still common property in nature. But it is distinct from the rest of the common property that it's not available to use by all of the owners. And those owners that hold those rights, either registered or created, have to unfortunately bear the costs of repairs and maintenance to that area of common property. When the developer of the sectional title scheme transfers any unit to, a, to another person, the Act provides that a body corporate comes into existence for that scheme. A, a scheme's body corporate exists to manage and administer the scheme. At first, only the members of the body, the only members of the body corporate rather, are the developer. But as he starts selling off units, more and more members start joining the body corporate until such time as the developer no longer owns a unit in the scheme and he's no longer a member. Every sectional title scheme has two sets of rules. These rules bind both the body corporate and all owners of units in the scheme, as well as any other person who occupies a unit, a family member, a tenant perhaps. The rules provide for the management and administration as well as the use and enjoyment of both sections and common property. These are two sets of rules. The first, as I mentioned earlier, are known as the management rules. The second, the conduct rules. A lot of body corporates and clients that come to me refer to house rules. Unfortunately, if your rules are not either management or conduct rules and are not lodged or registered with the Registrar of Deeds, there is no such thing as a set of house rules. A lot of body corporates have house rules for simple day-to-day -day matters, but if the rules aren't registered, they can't be enforced. The Act provides for the management of a sectional title scheme by trustees, who are either appointed or elected in terms of the scheme's rules. It is the trustees elected by the owners or the members of the scheme. Again, something that the members wish to forget when the trustees are telling them to do something that they don't want to. Election of trustees is normally a democratic process. Trustees are elected by the members. These trustees perform and exercise the body corporate's functions and powers as set out in the Sectional Titles Act. The trustees usually meet quite regularly in order to manage the day-to-day -day administration of the scheme. They take the decisions that make the unit owners liable for contributions to the scheme's expenses, either as monthly levy contributions or as special levies. 
The owners of units who meet much less frequently are entitled to impose restrictions or to give directions on the trustees or to the trustees by way of resolutions taken at a general meeting. To summarize, but not to end off the presentation, unfortunately, I'm not that quick. Sectional title is a legal arrangement in terms of which parts of a building known as sections can be exclusively owned together with shared ownership of all other parts of the buildings and the land, which is known as common property. You will almost always be marketing and negotiating the sale of units, each of which includes a section and a share in the common property. Parts of the common property in a sectional title scheme may be subject to exclusive use rights. So one or more owners may be entitled to the sole use of a specified part of the common property and of course be obliged to pay all the costs relating to repairs and maintenance. Most usually the private parking bays, yards and garden areas you market will be exclusive use areas. But if they are within buildings, they could also be separate sections or they could be common property. A scheme is administered by its own body corporate and all the owners of units in that scheme are members of the body corporate. So the purchaser will on taking transfer of a sectional title unit be a participant in a building collective that collects money from its members to meet the common expenses and manages the complex in accordance with the act as well as its rules. A new member is liable for a share of the body corporate's debts even if they relate to past expenses. Another thing that a lot of purchasers don't want to hear about. A draft sectional plan is prepared by a qualified land surveyor or architect and is submitted to the Surveyor General for approval. Should he be satisfied that the draft sectional plan complies with the requirements of the Sectional Titles Act, it will be the sectional plan of the scheme. The sectional plan shows the buildings and the land comprised in the scheme as divided into sections and common property, including a sectional plan of subdivision, consolidation and extension. A scheme cannot be registered in the deeds registry without a sectional plan. A sectional plan consists of at least four sheets. The first is the information sheets or the title sheet, which provides the basic information relating to the sectional title scheme. It refers to the sectional plan number or the surveyor general diagram number, the SS number, which is the sectional scheme number. That is the number that you would type into a deed search in, in order to find information relating to the sectional title scheme. It will have information regarding the architect and the developer. It will also have the location of the scheme in case you're marketing uh, multiple schemes with the same names, just in different locations. That's the bottom half of the same title sheet or information sheet. The next is the block plan. This shows the boundaries and beacons of any buildings erected on the land. It's basically a bird's eye view of the scheme without going into the nitty gritty details of what is sections and what is common property. For all intents and purposes, this sheet of the sectional plan is the most important, especially if you're wanting to find out what is a section, what is common property, and if there are any registered exclusive use areas. This is known as the floor plan. In this example in front of you, you can see a section as well as some common property being a staircase, a corridor, and a foyer. And then of course a stoop. As you can see, the stoop is part of the section. If not, it would have had a CP for common property or even exclusive use area if it was a registered exclusive use area. Here's another example of a floor plan. This is one that denotes parking bays. And in this instance, this is an example of registered exclusive use areas. These parking bays create real rights to the holders of the exclusive use areas. And if you had to uplift a copy of their title deed, you would find a notarial deed of session that would give them the rights to these exclusive use areas. The last sheet is the participation quota schedule, which shows the participation quota or PQ of each individual section in the scheme, as well as the all important total of 100. At all times, the total in a sectional title scheme have to add up to 100. So if somebody extends their section, which we'll talk about later, everybody else's participation quota decreases because that total always has to add up to 100. So if your neighbor wants to extend the boundaries of their section, that means that you'll be paying less levies. Unfortunately, you'll also share less in the common property and you'll have a lower vote when votes are taken by poll but most importantly, you'll pay less levies. 
The original sectional titles Act 66 of 1971, which came into operation in 1973, was replaced by the current sectional titles Act 95 of 1986, which came into operation on the 1st of June 1988. Since then, it's been regularly amended, as recent as the 30th of July this year. The Act regulates, firstly, the way in which buildings are divided into sections and common property, and what if any parts of the common property are subject to registered exclusive use rights. In this regard, it provides for the survey and drafting, approval and registration of a sectional plan, and for amendments to that plan to cater for changes to the physical structures in the scheme, or changes to the rights held by owners. Secondly, the way in which rights of ownership, mortgage bonds, and other registered rights are registered and transferred. Thirdly, the formations of body corporate that control and manage sectional title schemes by their operations and the rules that exist for that scheme. Finally, it covers various miscellaneous issues, such as the establishment of a sectional title regulations board and incidental matters. It is the third aspect, the establishment and management of the body corporate and the details of the decision making and other operations that will be removed from the Sectional Titles Act and dealt with in the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act of 2011. But at this stage, this 2011 Act, the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, has not yet been brought into operation. While I will deal in some detail with its provisions later on in this presentation, it is very important that you understand that all aspects of sectional title scheme creation and management are currently regulated and governed by the Sectional Titles Act 95 of 1986. We expect that the Department of Human Settlements, working closely with the Community Scheme Ombud Service, will arrange for Parliament to finalize the text of the regulations for this 2011 Act during the course of this year. Unfortunately, the course of this year is running out, but we are optimistic that before December hits, we'll all be operating in a much different environment. If at any stage you want to know the current status, and particularly whether or not the 2011 Act is in force, please go to our website or contact us. After the initial definition section of the Sectional Titles Act of 1986, the Act is broken up into 10 parts. Part one establishes the legal basis for separate registered ownership of parts of a building. It deals with the application of the Deeds Registries Act, which in effect supplements the provisions of the Sectional Titles Act. In part two, covering section four to 14, the Act sets out the process of building survey and the drafting and, and registration of original and amen amending sectional plans. Parts three and four, the Act deals in detail with the conveyancing issues with regard to sections on the, all the common property. It also provides for the subdivision, consolidation, and extension of sections. Parts five and six continue dealing with the conveyancing and registration issues, particularly with the addition of further sections or pieces of land to the scheme, the creation of exclusive use rights over portions of the common property, and servitudes that either burden or benefit the land in a scheme. Part seven of the Act deals with the participation quotas and the diminishing interest of the developer in the scheme. As I mentioned earlier, the developer's interest in a sectional title scheme diminishes as he sells off units that once belonged to him to third parties who are then members of the scheme. In parts eight, the focus of the Act shift to scheme management issues with the formation and operation of bodies corporate, their functions and powers, as well as their rules, the role of the trustees and the right of owners to approach the court, the high court that is, to intervene in management issues when necessary. Parts nine and 10 of the Act contains various miscellaneous and transitional issues. As I said earlier, you'll almost always be marketing and negotiating the sale of units, which again is a portion of the common property and a section. Here is an example of a full description of a unit in a deed of transfer. It refers to the section number, the sectional plan number, the name of the scheme, where it's located, the square meterage, which, which is of course important for the participation quota, and of course the all-important undivided share in the common property. Your sale agreements should specify the door number, the scheme name, and the street address. It can also indicate the section number, the deeds office number of the scheme, 
and it's sensible but not essential to also include the floor area of the section and include a specific reference to the share in common property. A lot of times there's a bit of confusion in the deeds office as well as with conveyances when units are transferred that a unit is called number two, but in actual fact it's section 178. This is where the problem slips in when the incorrect numbers are used in the sale agreement. It's then transferred to the deed of transfer that the conveyancer lodges in the deeds registry. Instances have happened where an owner is happily sitting in his unit, unbeknown to him that unit no longer belongs to him. It's now owned by somebody else because the estate agent and the conveyancing attorney incorrectly use the door number instead of the section number. So it's important when you mark it to rather use the section number because at the end of the day, that is the number that's reflected in the deeds registry when you do a search on the ownership of the unit. If you are dealing with the sale of a unit before the sectional plan is approved or if the sectional title register is not yet opened by the developer, you will probably be using the sale agreement prepared by the developer's conveyancing attorney. But if not, I suggest that you contact an attorney to get details of how the property should properly be described. While there is no legal requirement to do so, it is usual for a, sa for a sale agreement to specifically mention that on transfer of the sectional property, the purchaser will become a member of the scheme and become bound by the rules applicable to the body corporate. This practice emphasizes the importance of the purchaser understanding the compulsory membership of the sectional title community, which is a non-negotiable feature of ownership of sectional property. And it's an application of the provisions of the Sectional Titles Act, the prescribed rules, as well as the scheme's own specific rules. It is also standard practice to include the current amount of the monthly levies, which will become payable by the purchaser to the body corporate on registration of transfer. Levies can be calculated pro rata. In other words, if the unit is transferred on the 10th of the month, the seller will be liable for the levies from the 1st to the 9th, and the purchase will be liable from the 10th until the 31st. Special levies, however, are one of those contributions that is not allocated pro rata. If a special levy is raised and the trustee resolution is signed while the seller is still the registered owner, he is liable for the full payment of that special levy, irrespective of the fact that installments are only due and payable after transfer goes through. An agreement can be entered into between the seller and purchaser, but it's got nothing to do with the body corporate. When collecting that special levy, the body corporate only looks, as the, looks at the seller who was the registered owner at the time that the special levy was raised. He doesn't care that the purchase, it doesn't care rather, that the purchaser is now the registered owner. owner. Most sectional title sales will include rights to a private parking bay, a, a yard or a garden area, and these will usually be exclusive use areas, but again, not always. It can also be common property or a section. If the exclusive use area is registered, that is shown on the scheme sectional plan and of course on the title deed, an example of the formal description is the following. In this example, you see that it's a parking bay, what its number is, the square meterage, in which scheme it's located, where it's located, and on what sectional plan it will be demarcated. This is the description of an exclusive use area that is created in terms of the rules. Again, it simply refers to the parking bay, the number, the square meterage, and then of course it says whether or not it's created in terms of the management or the conduct rules. It also refers to who the exclusive use area is allocated to. Of course, it can only be allocated to a registered owner in the scheme. The Act allows a developer on opening of the sectional title register to reserve for a specified period, typically 10 or 20 years, sometimes less, sometimes more, the right to build more sections and to extend the scheme by the registration of further sectional plans showing the additional sections and additional exclusive use areas. This is known as developing a scheme in phases and is provided for in section 25 of the Act. If you find yourself with a mandate to sell either an entire future development right or a right relating to a number of additional sections or a fragment of that developer's right, we strongly suggest that you go to an attorney who specializes in sectional title development to assist in the drafting of the special purpose sale agreement that's required. 
When a sectional title register is opened, a certificate of registered sectional title is issued to the developer for each unit in the scheme. When the developer or any subsequent owner transfers a unit, a deed of transfer is issued to the new owner. Registered exclusive use rights are held under notarial deeds. There are no title deeds for exclusive use rights that are created in terms of either the scheme's management or conduct rules. Conditions of title are restrictions on an owner's right to deal freely with his or her property or record some other person's entitlements in relation to the property. A certificate of registered sectional title or a deed of transfer which evidences ownership of a unit includes only a bare reference to, those, to these conditions. But on the opening of a sectional title register, the developer's conveyancer lodges a certificate that sets out the title deed conditions in detail. The certificate is available in the register kept for each sectional title scheme at the deeds office. In terms of the Sectional Titles Act, there are implied servitudes that operate between sections in a scheme and between sections and the common property in the scheme. In essence, each section is entitled to be supported by any other section and any common property beneath it or next to it and which is capable of supporting it. Each section is subject and entitled to a right of way through other sections and the common property so that water, sewage, drainage, gas, electricity, garbage, artificially heated or cooled air and any other services can pass through other sections or the common property on the way to the various sections that it services. In terms of the Sectional Titles Act, if the purpose for which a section is intended to be used is shown expressly or by implication on a registered sectional plan, it may not be used for any other purpose unless all of the owners in the scheme have agreed to the change of use. If an owner that is requesting that their section be used for a different use other than what is demarcated on the sectional plan, he, make, he can make application to the body corporate. If for some reason one of the members unreasonably withholds consent, the applicant can approach the High Court for relief. The High Court will then consider the circumstances and might gr grant an order that the body corporate simply has to allow the change of use. An interesting example is what I'm currently facing in the body corporate where I reside and where I'm a trustee. It's mostly holiday accommodation, so there's very few owners. A lot of the units are rented out on a daily basis even. Owners are wanting to enclose their balconies. The reason for this is they're wanting to change the use of the balcony that they can convert it into an additional room that they can hire out. Similarly, owners that own garages attempt to change the use of the garage from simple storage and parking your vehicle to rental accommodation. Running a business from your residential section is also considered as a change of use. It doesn't only need the approval of the trustees. You have to get every single owner in the scheme to agree to this change of use. The Act protects rather residential tenants in properties being developed as sectional title schemes. So this relates to buildings or, or, or land that is not yet sectional title developments. I don't think we have a lot of them anymore. Most of, sec most of the sectional title developments are built from the land up, not really existing. But there are still some share blocks that will, uh, that will be converted to sectional title and this would apply to them for example. Unless all the residential tenants have confirmed in writing that they know their rights and they do not wish to buy the properties that they currently occupy, the developer cannot start the process without first giving all these residents a notice of a meeting. At this meeting, the developer must give the residential tenants details of the proposed sectional title scheme it wishes to develop, as well as the copy of the building condition report and an estimate of the scheme's running costs. In other words, the levies that they would pay. Once the developer has held the residential tenants meeting and answered all reasonable questions posed to it, the development process can begin, but those tenants have the right of first refusal. This means that the developer cannot sell a unit without first offering it to the rele relevant residential tenant, and of course holding the offer open for a period of 90 days. It is important to realize that the tenants do have an option to buy the properties that they occupy. The developer is not unfortunately obliged to sell the units to those residential tenants, but if he wants to sell a unit while it is still occupied, he has to first offer it for sale to the current tenant. Having offered a unit to a tenant, the developer cannot offer it to someone else for a lower price without first again offering it to that same tenant for a period of 60 days. 
The developer also cannot, for a period of 180 days, after an offer to residential tenant has expired or been refused, evict that tenant or increase the rental. Unless, of course, the tenant has failed to pay rental, or has inflicted material damage to the unit, or caused a nuisance to occupiers of other units in the building. And, of course, if the proper legal proceedings have been followed. Section 2514 of the Act provides that whenever a right to extend a scheme by the addition of further sections has been reserved, either by the developer or by a body corporate, every sale of a unit in that scheme must disclose the fact of the reservation. The section does not require the details of the nature of the proposed extension, just the fact that there is such a right reserved. If a sale agreement does not contain this disclosure, the purchaser can at any time decide to annul the agreement without any consequences. If a developer elects to make rules under Section 32.4 of the Act by which a different value is attached to the vote of an, of an owner of a section or the liability of the owner to make contributions or levy contributions, the developer also has to disclose this fact. So at the moment, in a sectional title scheme, your levies are determined according to your participation quota. But if the developer wishes to add another method, for example, the market value of the units, he has to first create a rule in terms of Section 32.4 of the Act. And this is the rule that has to be disclosed in sale agreements. And just if a right of reservation by the developer in terms of Section 25 is not disclosed, the same with the a rule in terms of Section 32.4. The purchaser can annul the sale agreement without any consequences. This normally happens in a mixed-use development where there's commercial sections on the ground floor and residential sections above, where the owner of the commercial section doesn't feel it's reasonable or fair to be held liable for the cost of uh, the elevator that only services the owners of the residential sections. The cost of repairs and maintenance of the elevator can then be excluded from the commercial owner's levy determinations and only paid for by the residential owners. This can't be done in the normal course. A rule in terms of Section 32.4 has to be established, and again, it has to be agreed to by every single owner that would be adversely affected. I would say in my example that every single residential owner would be adversely affected because if you take away the, develop the commercial owner's contributions, the residential owner would owners would contribute more. Every sectional title scheme is managed and controlled by its own body corporate. All the registered owners of units are members of the body corporate and have the right to participate in its decisions when members are entitled to make these decisions. The body corporate is responsible for the enforcement of the rules and for the control, administration and management of the common property for the benefit of all the owners. It has a list of specific functions and powers set out in the Act and it may have other powers set out in the body corporate's rules. Some of the most important functions of the, of the body corporates is the following, to raise levies from owners to meet its, ex its expenses and to operate an administrative fund for this purpose. I sometimes get the question of, of whether or not a body corporate has to open its own bank account or if they could simply rely on the bank account that is in the name of their managing agent. In terms of the Sectional Titles Act, the trustees shall open a bank account and administer that administrative fund. That is the account that all the owners pay their levies into and of course the expenses get paid out of it. It is of course fine if a managing agent that is registered as an estate agent in terms of the Estate Agency Affairs Act and of course has the necessary fidelity fund certificates to receipt payments for all of the body corporates that they manage. As long as those payments and the expenses that are required to be paid from those payments are eventually receipted to the body corporate's account. The body corporate, of course, wants to get the interest on those monies and not simply hand it over to the managing agent, unless, of course, the managing agent agreement allows for it. Another function of the trustees is to insure the buildings. The body corporate insurance policy is for the common property of the scheme. It also includes geyser cover. As I'll mention later, geyser repairs and maintenance are for the owner's account that actually make use of that geyser, even if the geyser is placed on common property. But geysers have to be insured in terms of the body corporate insurance policy. An ex-colleague of mine, a managing agent, liked to use the example um, to see what, is, what forms part of the body corporate insurance. She used to say that if you take the building, turn it upside down and shake it about, anything that doesn't fall out is body corporate insurance. Anything that does, forms part of your home contents insurance. 
and is your responsibility. Another function is to repair and maintain the scheme's common property, and when necessary, to replace items that cannot be repaired. The powers of everybody corporate include the following, to appoint agents, such as managing agents, and employees. To buy or hire things, owners need to enjoy or protect the common property. For example, electric fencing or generators. We'll touch on generators again a little bit. To borrow money and to enforce the rules of the scheme. Owners make decisions by way of resolutions, which are usually taken at formal meetings. There are three different types of resolutions. Ordinary, special, and unanimous. They all have different requirements that are linked to them. Ordinary resolutions require a simple majority, or 51% of the vote, of a normal quorum that's required for a meeting. A special resolution requires a 75% vote of a quorum of a meeting, whereas a unanimous resolution requires 100% of the vote of an 80% quorum, which is higher than the normal requirements for a meeting. Unanimous and special resolutions can also be taken by way of round-robin processes, where owners sign their agreement to specific de decisions as opposed to attending a meeting. The functions and powers of the body corporate must be performed and exercised by the trustees of the body corporate hol holding office as elected by the members in terms of the act and the rules. The trustees must manage the scheme in accordance with the provisions of the act, the scheme's rules, and any restriction imposed or direction given by the members at a general meeting. So in practice, the day-to-day -day management and month-to-month -month management is not car carried out by the owners, but by the trustees. The owners, however, elect the trustees to manage the scheme. Trustees are in a position of trust, and they owe the body corporate certain duties of care. They must act honestly and in good faith and avoid any material conflict of their own interests with those of the body corporate. An example that I use sometimes get a, gets a laugh, sometimes not. When I was trustee, or still am, I was required to offer my body corporate certain legal litigation services. I had to recuse myself from the meeting when the decision was taken to appoint my firm. And unfortunately for us, I also had to recuse myself when the decision was taken whether or not to pay my invoice. Luckily, when I returned to their room, they had decided to pay the invoice. A sectional title body corporate must be controlled and managed in terms of its rules. Apart from regulating the operation of the body corporate and the behavior of the trustees, rules regulate the conduct of owners and other occupiers of sections and set out the limitations that they have to observe in their behavior, both within their sections as well as on the common property. Each scheme has two sets of rules, namely the management and conduct rules, as we spoke about earlier, which are applicable to every body corporate. Most schemes have the prescribed rules in terms of the Sectional Titles Act, but it is possible, perhaps even likely, that a scheme will have some special type of rules that are specific to its own needs. Most schemes have very extensive non-standard rules, sometimes longer than the ones prescribed in the Act. These rules bind the body corporate as well as all owners and occupants of sections. While a casual visitor to a scheme is not personally bound by the rules, the prescribed rules oblige that the owner ensures that any casual visitors, including employees or guests or members of their family, comply with the scheme's rules. The management rules deal mostly with the administrative, control, financial management, and general administration of the scheme. But there are some management rules that deal with the rights and obligations of owners in their improvement and use of their sections exclusive use areas, and unregulated areas of common property. The prescribed conduct rules deal with conduct issues, such as the keeping of pets, parking on common property, littering and refuse, damage to and security devices on common property, storage of inflammable materials, pest control, and other practical issues of property use and conduct. We like to refer to it as the, P, the three Ps of sectional title, pets, parties, and parking. Those are the issues that we mostly have to deal with on a day-to-day -day ba basis. <laughs> Management rules can be amended by unanimous resolution of the owners. Conduct rules can be changed by a special resolution of the members. All rules must be reasonable and must apply equally to all owners of units put to the same purpose. I received a question on Tuesday relating to different rules for tenants than there are for owners. 
At the moment, the Sectional Titles Act has no legal link to tenants, other than the fact that the owners have to ensure that their tenants in, uh, apply, or comply rather, with the rules. But a body corporate cannot have one rule for tenants and one rule for owners. The one that happens most often is that an owner is allowed to keep a pet, but not a tenant. Rules have to be applied equally and reasonably. You can't say yes to one owner and then no to another, and you definitely can't say no to tenants. The body corporate must advise the Registrar of Deeds of any change to the management and conduct rules. No change to the management or conduct rules is effective until the notification has been filed with the Registrar of Deeds. I'd like to stop here for two seconds just to emphasize the importance of having your rules filed. On almost a daily basis, I get a request to have a look at a set of management rules or conduct rules that the body corporate has been applying for the last 5, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. I ask the question if the rules are registered. No, we don't know. Can I go down to the deeds office and have a look if there are? Yes, you can. Go to the deeds office, uplift the SS file for the scheme. What do I find? Nothing. There's no rules that are filed at the deeds registry for that body corporate. So for the last 20 years, the trustees have been telling owners that they're not allowed to keep pets, where in actual fact the prescribed conduct rule says that they are. It's very important when you manage and when you market in a sectional title development to make sure that the set of rules that you're giving to prospective purchasers and that you're enforcing on the members of the scheme are indeed the set of rules that are filed by the Registrar of Deeds. Unfortunately, the deeds office simply rubber stamps the rules, which is something I'll talk about a bit later, but those rules have to be in that file in order to be enforced. Simply approving an amendment at a general meeting means nothing. Signing a trustee resolution to have the rules filed means nothing. It's the actual filing of the rules at the deeds office that is the most important consideration as to whether or not a set of rules is actually enforceable and valid. In the absence of an exclusive use arrangement, each and every owner is entitled to use all parts of the common property, subject only to the, rights, the use rights of other owners, the provisions of the Sectional Titles Act, and the scheme's rules. But an owner is not entitled to alter any part of the common property or dispose of any rights in the common property unless specifically authorized in terms of the Act or the rules. An owner is obliged to repair and maintain his section in a state of good repair if, for example, a hand basin in a section overflows and as a result water damage is caused to the unit below, the owner of the unit concerned, in other words, the owner of the unit where the source originates, has the responsibility to fix or repair that source of the leak. Unfortunately, the owner of the unit below that suffered the damages only has a claim against the body corporate insurance policy. And in most cases, because of the existence of negligence, that claim will be repudiated. What does the owner of the damaged unit do? They then sue the owner of the unit above for damages. The same would be if the source of the leak had to come from the common property. The body corporate would be responsible to repair the source of the leak, but the damage to the unit affected, unfortunately, is for the account of that owner, unless, of course, they can be successful with an insurance claim or with a damages claim in court. The Act provides two specific exceptions to the principle that an owner is responsible to repair and maintain his or own section. The first relates to plant, machinery, fixtures and fittings used in connection with the common property and sections in the scheme. The second relates to pipes, wires, cables and ducts existing on the land and capable of being used in connection with the common property or more than one section. Whether or not these items are part of a section or the common property, the owner of the section isn't obliged to, to repair and maintain it. The body corporate is. So a communal waste pipe, for example, that is connected to each floor of a multi-storey dwelling is the responsibility of the body corporate, even if certain parts of it are situated within a section. The body corporate of a scheme may properly maintain the common property and keep it in a, in a state of good and serviceable repair. The regular repainting of a building or resurfacing of an area of tarmac must be carried out and paid for by the body corporate which is, of course, as part of the members' contributions. Aside from normal wear and tear resulting from the lawful exercise of, of, of rights, if an owner or another person causes damage to a part of the common property, the body corporate in turn has a right to recover those damages from the owner as a result of the person's actions or negligence. And this is, of course, if the body corporate insurance policy has repudiated the claim. 
An exception to the principle that the body corporate is obliged to maintain the common property is where an owner holds an exclusive use right, either registered or created in terms of the rules. The holder of the exclusive use right in terms of the act is required to keep it in a clean and neat condition. And the body corporate, having carried out any of the repairs and maintenance on the owner's behalf, has the right to recover these costs from the members. In terms of the Sectional Titles Act, a body corporate doesn't have an option to recover exclusive use area contributions from owners. The act says it shall. So on your levy statement, you'll have two line items, if not more, one being for your levy contribution and the other being for an exclusive use area contribution. If you pay those contributions, the body corporate has the responsibility to repair and, and maintain that exclusive use area up to the value of the monies that they've been recovering from you on a monthly basis. If those contributions are not recovered from the owners, then unfortunately the owners have to pay directly for the repairs and maintenance. If a hot water cylinder supplies hot water to one or more sections, this is a geezer, then whether it's part of the common property or not, the owners who are served by that appliance have to repair and maintain it. And of course, geezers have to be included in the body corporate insurance policy. There are instances where the lack of maintenance or repairs to the common property results in damages to sections. The roof, foundation and outer skin of the building all comprise the common property. If a section is damaged as a result of a crack in an outside wall or an inadequately damp-proof foundation or a badly maintained roof, the owner of the unit concerned, although responsible for the repair of their section, will have a claim for damages against the body corporate. When I was a litigation attorney, I dealt with an arbitration where the owner instituted a massive claim against the body corporate for certain water ingress into her section. When the body corporate went to do an inspection, they found that the water damage had, was so bad that the window frames and door frames were actually falling away from the walls. Turned out the owner hadn't been into her section for the last 15 years. Needless to say, the body corporate walked away scot-free. An owner has the responsibility to inspect their units, exactly the same as a landlord has in terms of the Rental Housing Act. An owner has the responsibility in law to mitigate their damages. So when you see the signs of water ingress and you suspect that it comes from the common property, alert the body corporate immediately that they can undertake the necessary repairs before damages occur that the body corporate will no longer be held liable for. The trustees can make minor alterations to the common property, as long as the alterations do not constitute improvements. They may create gardens and generally care for and tend to the common property. Prescribed Conduct Rule 4 deals with alterations or additions to the common property and prohibits any owner or occupier from marking, painting, driving nails or screws or the like into or otherwise damaging or altering any part of the common property without first obtaining the written consent of the trustees. This provision only authorizes very minor alterations to the common property by owners who have first obtained the trustees' consent. The trustees cannot consent to ma major alterations that will affect the common property. As an exception to the general prohibition of owner improvements, this conduct rule makes specific provision for the rights of owners to install on the common property, locking and security devices to protect a section, screens and other devices to prevent animals or insects from entering a section, provided that the trustees have first given their written consent. When in doubt, first get the written consent of the trustees. Prescribed Conduct Rule 6 specifically prevents owners in a residential scheme from erecting notices or advertisements on the common property, which can be visible from the outside of the section without the prior written consent of the trustees. These are where all of you come in. It's where you place your for sale signs on the common property of, of the scheme. You first have to get the trustees' consent. The trustees can withhold their consent if that signage is, uh, is visible from outside of the section. And of course, the whole point of putting up a for sale or a too late sign is that other people can see it. So it would be visible from outside of the section. If you put the signage outside of common property, in other, other words, on municipal land, you'd obviously need to abide by the municipal bylaws. Then the body corporate can't say anything. But if you place it on a section or on the common property, the trustees first have to have give their approval. In terms of Section 38C of the Act, a body corporate has the power to purchase, hire, or otherwise acquire movable property for the use of owners for their enjoyment or protection, or in connection with the enjoyment and protection of the common property. 
This provision of the Act authorizes a body corporate, for example, to purchase items such as lawn mowers or garden furniture. We have a bit of a debate going in the office at the moment as to whether or not a generator would be seen as a movable item. In other words, an item that the trustees can acquire without having to go to the owners. My version is that a generator would be seen as an improvement to the common property, sometimes just because of the nature of the generator and the cost of a generator, because it has so many effects, noise and smell disturbances, it's all about where it's placed. My colleague, however, sees it as a movable purchase that the trustees are required to make, which is fine as long as the trustees don't install their generator under the bedroom window of the owner that doesn't pay their levies. In terms of Section 38D of the Act, a body corporate has the power, where it is practical, to establish and maintain on the common property suitable lawns and gardens and recreation facilities. Trustees, however, need to ensure that before they exercise these powers, the budgets approved by the members actually include these funds, which can be applied for these purposes. No use in installing a garden area if you can't even afford the water bill to, to irrigate the garden. Prescribed Management Rules 33, 1 and 2 provides a process according to which owners can agree to upgrade or supplement the scheme's uh, common property. While there are no separate meters to record the consumption of electricity, water and gas supplied to each section in the common property, the cost of these services is paid for by the body corporates and is of course in turn paid for by the owners as part of their levy contributions that are determined according to their participation quota. If the majority of owners give the trustees a written instruction to arrange for the installation of separate meters, they must do so at the body corporate's cost. The individual consumption, however, will be for the cost of those owners making use of these services. The trustees cannot carry out any luxurious improvement to the common property without the authority of a unanimous resolution of the owners. There is no guidance in the Sectional Titles Act as to what is considered to be an improvement and what will or not be taken into consideration as the factors to establish when an improvement is luxurious or non-luxurious. Any substantial or permanent change to the common property is seen as an improvement and any improvement which is arguably not necessary or likely um, to be needed is considered luxurious. Again, people have different views as to what is luxurious and non-luxurious, and all depending on the scheme and the nature of its members and the capability of the members, one can determine a normally luxurious item as being that of non-luxurious. An example of a luxurious improvement to common property that I like to use is a swimming pool. But when I presented in Durban, an estate agent said to me that their scheme sees a swimming pool as being a non-luxurious item because that scheme is used for mostly holiday accommodation and the owners come there at a certain time of the year when they want to swim, and the beaches are just not conducive to going for a swim. So in their scheme, a swimming pool is seen as a non-luxurious improvement. If you had to ask the same question to a body corporate in Cape Town in the middle of winter, the answer would be different. The trustees have the right if they believe that a non-luxurious improvement to common property, over which no exclusive use rights are created or registered, of course, would be for the benefit of the scheme to start a process which can authorize the improvement to be funded by the body corporate. First, the trustees must give all owners written notice of their intention to carry out these luxurious improvements, or non-luxurious rather. The notice must say that they intend to proceed with the improvements after a 30-day period after the notice has been sent out, and it must tell the owners why the improvements are necessary and desirable, what they will cost, and how they will affect the levies, or whether a special levy will be required. If an, any one owner indicates that she or he is wishes the proposal to be discussed at a meeting, the trustees have to convene such a special general meeting where the proposed improvement will be discussed and the owners will be required to take a special resolution. If no owner asks for a meeting within the 30-day notice period, the trustees can proceed with the improvement. The basic principle is that an owner cannot change any part of the common property without the consent of every other owner, unless the change is specifically authorized by the rules, irrespective of exclusive use rights or the common property is jointly owned by all owners. In considering improvements to common property, one must draw a distinction between common property subject to rights of, rights of exclusive use and those that are not. 
If an owner obtains the permission of all the other owners in the scheme, he or she may improve an area of the common property, not subject to exclusive use rights. The owner will not automatically obtain any preferred right to the use and enjoyment of that area, however. An example that I like to use, and it actually happened, is where an owner obtained every single person's consent in the scheme, and you'll hear now why he was able to obtain everybody's consent, to install a swimming pool on the common property. Every owner, okay, go for it. You do it, you pay for it, we'll see what happens. After the pool had been installed and been filled, the owner came out of his unit to enjoy the swimming pool that he had built and paid for, only to find a couple of other owners doing exactly the same thing. The agreement with all the other owners would have to provide for this owner to have the preference of the right of use. If not, it's simply an improvement to the common property and everybody can use it. For such rights to continue despite changes in ownership of units, the agreement would have to be binding not only on current owners but in, on successors in title. The way in which this can be achieved is by incorporating this agreement into the scheme's rules. The prescribed management rules allow an owner who has exclusive use rights to construct or place a structure or building improvement on that exclusive use area. But he first needs to obtain the consent of the trustees. In considering an application to erect a structure or build on an exclusive use area, the trustees cannot unreasonably withhold such consent. But they may, give, they may not give their consent if it's in their opinion that the proposed structural building is effectively an extension of the floor area of a section or an additional section. In terms of Section 26 of the Act, a scheme can also be extended by the body corporate, acquiring and including additional land. It sometimes happens that a body corporate decides to buy additional land so as to extend the common property, maybe to install that swimming pool that they want. The purpose might be to create more facilities like additional parking bays or to build additional sections on the land as a source of income for the body corporate other than that of the levies. This can only happen when all the owners in a scheme have agreed in writing. Once the body corporate takes transfer of the additional land, it is considered to be owned by all of the owners in undivided shares because it's common property. The scheme's participation quota is not yet revised because it's simply common property and not yet sections. Section 25 of the Act allows the developer and later the body corporate, as we discussed earlier, to extend the scheme by the addition of sections. And either the developer or the body corporate may sell a whole or a fraction of that right. The sale of fractionalized future development rights is extremely complex. And I suggest that if you find yourself with the opportunity to obtain a mandate in this regard, either from a developer or a body corporate, you get detailed information from the developer or the body corporate, and you contact a specialist sectional title attorney like Paddox. As I've said earlier, registered exclusive use rights can be created either by the developer when the scheme is first established, or by the body corporate with the authority of a unanimous resolution or a special resolution if it's in terms of the conduct rules. If a developer or any other owner transfers his or her last unit in the scheme, any registered exclusive use area remaining in its name are automatically vested in the body corporate, free from any consideration and from any mortgage bonds. I never quite understood how a registered exclusive use area that is registered to a particular person either an owner of a section or the developer could not be transferred and simply vested in the body corporate. When would this actually happen? This happens when an error creeps in. Just the same as somebody else's section is transferred because the door number was used as opposed to a section number, an exclusive use area is sometimes forgotten about when proper instructions aren't given to the conveyancing attorney or the conveyancing attorney doesn't listen and transfers the section without the registered exclusive use right. If transfer of the section goes through without the registered exclusive use right, that exclusive use right falls to the body corporate automatically, free from any bonds that the owner or holder of the registered exclusive use right took out, which means that the owner or holder of that exclusive use right continues to pay the bank the mortgage bond on that exclusive use right without actually having the use and enjoyment of that right or selling it. 
Section 38I of the Act specifically includes in the powers of the body corporate the power to lease portions of the common property to existing owners or existing occupiers for a period of less than 10 years. So the body corporate may, for instance, rent out to owners or current occupiers storerooms in the building or parking spaces designated as common property. As the trustees are empowered to exercise the powers of the body corporate, only a trustee resolution is required to authorize such a short-term lease. The terms of such a short-term lease will be contained in a lease agreement entered into between the body corporate represented by the trustees and the owner or the lessee. It's important to note that a short-term lease agreement can only be entered into between the body corporate and a registered owner or a current occupier of a unit. So in other words, a, an, a, an owner, a tenant that has concluded a lease agreement of a residential section or a commercial section in the scheme, he is the only party to that lease agreement, not an outsider. So the trustees cannot enter into a short-term lease agreement with anybody outside of the scheme that is not an owner or a current tenant. Long-term leases, those are for 10 years or more for the natural life of a person sometimes, are regulated by Section 17.1 of the Act and can be entered into with the authority of a unanimous resolution of owners. Under Section 29 of the Act and by special resolution of the owners, the body corporate may enter into a servitude or other restrictive agreement burdening or benefiting the common property. An example of a servitude burdening the common property would be the right of an adjoining landowner to walk or drive across the common property to a roadway on the other side of the scheme from his own property. An example of this would be a resort sectional title scheme that I once managed that bordered um, a dock. The only way neighboring properties, those that did not form part of the sectional title development, could access this dock was actually entering through the access control of the scheme, walking across the common property or driving across the common property with their boats to get to the dock. The body corporates and the owners of the adjoining land had to enter into registered servitudes burdening the common property and therefore giving them the right to actually access the body corporates. Of course, they would have needed to abide by the body corporates rules. On the other hand, a servitude benefiting the common property might allow any owner in the scheme to walk or drive across the property of an adjoining landowner to a roadway on the other side of the adjoining land. Section 17 of the Act, other than allowing the, to enter a long-term lease, also allows the body corporate with the unanimous consent of the owners and the consent of all bondholders to sell all the common property in the scheme and sections in the scheme that are owned by the body corporate. When the units are transferred to a buyer in accordance with this provision, the scheme is cancelled. This normally happens when a sectional title scheme has quite a lot of common property that really isn't utilized for any specific purpose. And the body corporate feels that there is enough land to be able to sell off for building additional sections, perhaps. This will be an additional income to the body corporate because the income of that sale will belong to all the members of the scheme as it was a sale of the common property. Particularly when the buildings in the scheme have come to the end of their useful life or when owners decide that the building should be demolished and rebuilt, the alienation of the entire scheme is a useful alternative to the procedure of deeming the buildings to be destroyed, which is also quite a complicated process. We'll now talk about the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act. This is the act, as I mentioned earlier, that's not yet in force, but that we expect it to be any time towards the end of this year. The first eight sections of the Act deal with the creation, function, and powers of the body corporates, its meetings, and the role of trustees. <coughs> Sections 9 to 19 deal with various aspects of the operation of the body corporate and the scheme. Sections um, 18 to 22 and the schedule deal with various miscellaneous and transitional issues. Even myself as an attorney like to ignore these miscellaneous issues. What are they if they can't be classified under any specific category? The miscellaneous issues in the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act are going to be very important because the Sectional Titles Act 95 of 1986 is still going to be in force when the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act comes into force. It's just the management issues that are currently in the Sectional Titles Act that will be removed and placed into the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act. The conveyancing issues will still remain in the Sectional Titles Act, and it's these transitional and miscellaneous provisions of the Act that will be able to guide us when we need to know which Act to refer to.
In essence, the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act consolidates all the scheme management aspects of the Sectional Titles Act into one statute and makes limited changes to these provisions. The most important innovations in the 2011 Sectional Title Scheme Management Act are the following. The substitution of the Community Scheme Ombuds for the Deeds Registry in the process of lodgement and the revived process of examination of scheme rules. Up until 1997, the Deeds Registry used to have a look at every single rule of a set of rules that was lodged with them. After that period, it just became too much. Today, they simply rubber stamp a set of rules, which is why we have so many disputes as to the applicability of rules and the enforceability and even constitutional validity. In the future, and with the introduction of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act and Community Schemes Ombud Service Act, the Community Scheme Ombud will review every single rule that's placed before it for filing, before it accepts registration. If there's a rule that is not reasonable, that is not applied equally, and is not constitutional, the Community Scheme Ombud Service will simply refer it back to the body corporate to take it back to the drawing board, review it, rewrite it, and pass it again by the members for approval. The requirement for the reserve fund is another innovation. At the moment, there is no requirement as to the amount that must be kept in a reserve fund of the body corporate. With the introduction of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, an amount will be set. It will be an amount that changes and is prescribed by the Minister and the Government Gazette. And unfortunately, it's going to be an amount that a lot of body corporates currently don't have. You'll find that a lot of body corporates are going to have to raise special levies simply to be placed in a reserve. What's the point of it? It's prescribed by the Act. There's no getting around it. The requirement for special resolution to authorize scheme borrowings. At the moment, the trustees are entitled to enter into loan agreements on behalf of the body corporate. In future, the member's resolution will be required. The requirement that levy collections be adjudicated by the Community Scheme Ombud. At the moment, you hand over your levies that are in arrears to either debt collection agents or to levy collection attorneys. In the future, these arrear levy disputes will be adjudicated by the Community Scheme Ombud Service and no longer by attorneys such as myself. The Community Scheme Ombud Service supervision of scheme administrators, that's for the managing agents out there. Finally, I'll mention again that the 2011 Sectional Title Schemes Management Act is not yet in operation. The next step is the publication of its regulations, which are the rules, the things we're really interested in, together with the 2011 Community Scheme Ombud Service Act. For public comment, the finalization of the regulations and the President's assent to both of these acts coming into force. We expect that this will happen during the end of this year and we'll keep you advised on the progress. In the interim, our suggestion to you is that you organize yourselves in preparation for the large amount of work to be done in a short period of time when it does become effective. And if you need any, any questions answered, you have any queries or even complaints, please feel free to contact PADOX. I'd like to thank you for your time this afternoon.